Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Lindsay Homewood. I'm Oxesis on Twitter. I'm an engineering manager at Bulletproof Networks, which is a managed hosting company in Sydney, Australia. All right, so I live in this area called uh, the Blue Mountains, which is like uh, the Grand Canyon with the trees. Uh, and you may know me from some of these other projects, Cucumber and Argios, which allows you to write Nagios checks in Cucumber, uh, Bizarre for graphing data in the browser um, from CollectD and Flapjack, um, which you're interested in, you can come and talk to me about later on. Okay.
the mainstream explanation for what happened was that this was the pilots misunderstanding their circumstances, that they were poorly trained, they failed to react swiftly, and they ignored alarms. And this was a view espoused from you know, very major, well-known publications that we sort of know and expect to deliver something reasonably accurate, something that we trust. And maybe not Gizmodo, though. <laughs> and this is a very convenient narrative for what happened in the final 15 minutes of the flight. Specifically, decomposing all the different things that happened and trying to hone in on the broken component and find that root cause. And the simplest root cause is this human error. The pilots were negligent, they weren't following their training, they crashed the plane. And this feeds into this concept of having bad apples, amoral actors in our systems that are actively working against the normal functioning of that system. And then there's this mentality of if we weed out the bad apples, then maybe that system will equalize. But Sidney Decker, uh, who's a professor of human factors and flight safety at Lund University in Sweden, says that what you call this root cause, what you call root cause, is simply the place that you stop looking any further. So why don't we start looking a little bit further? Let's look at the flight experience of the people that were operating the plane, given that they were apparently poorly trained and inexperienced. We have Captain Dubois, 10,988 flying hours, of which 6,258 of them were as captain. On this particular plane, an Airbus A330, there were 1,747 flying hours as captain. Let's look at Robert, first officer. 6,547 flying hours, of which 4,479 of them were on an Airbus A330. Bonin, most junior pilot, 2,936 hours, of which 807 were on an Airbus A330. Now, does this sound like that they are inexperienced? Certainly has had a lot of flying hours. And there's a fundamental problem with this particular mindset, which is what happens if you substitute other people into exactly the same situation? How are they going to react under the same stresses and pressures? And BEA, which is the French equivalent of the FAA, uh, came to exactly the same conclusion in their report. Specifically, a different crew should have done exactly the same action. We cannot blame this crew. And that feeds into this idea of people just being actors in a complex system. In fact, you could think of them as a system within a complex system, or maybe a series of systems within a series of nested complex systems. How does that tally with this idea of a root cause? It's a very Cartesian, Newtonian worldview, where you have actions have equal and opposite reactions, and if you follow the trail of events, a linear trail of events, you can you know, go all the way back to the beginning, and in the vast majority of cases in our society, we attribute that to human error. And the real problem with that worldview is that hindsight does not in any way equal foresight. Hindsight converts a once vague and unlikely future into an immediate certain past, also by Sidney Decker. We're very lucky in that we have all the facts. We have them all nicely and conveniently laid out for us, in front of us. And those facts were very hard earned. It was a three-year operation to dredge, firstly to identify where the plane crashed, uh, then to dredge the ocean, to eventually settle on the flight data recorder. And once we had the flight data recorder, we could crack that open and we could look at all the different figures and numbers and graph them. We also had meteorological information that we could refer to as well, that we could correlate with that data that we retrieved. And on top of that, we have survey maps as well of the ocean. That investigation took three years for an event that unfolded in 10 minutes. And the problem was that the actors in a complex system, the pilots, were operating in a very dense and thick fog of war. They had limited facts at hand, and the situation was rapidly developing. And they were applying a concept called local rationality, 
which is basically that people make what they think are the best decisions based on the data at hand. And we're very lucky in that we have hindsight. You know, it affords us global rationality. We have all the facts, we have all the figures, and we can piece them all together and you know, decompose stuff and find the broken component and blame that. In this particular case, it was the humans that was the broken component, apparently. So, let's go deeper. What were the systems that were actually in play? Let's go, uh, let's go have a look at the modes of operation of those particular systems. So you've got a bunch of flight control modes that the flight control computer is operating under. Uh, and these, uh, these are to do with uh, uh, taxiing on the runway in normal law, um, uh, maintaining an altitude and the attitude of the plane in flight, flare mode as well for landing the plane. And the vast majority of time, an Airbus A330, in fact, most Airbus uh, airplanes are operating in this normal law. Uh, but sometimes they will transition into this other law called alternate law. And the plane has very, very different flight characteristics when it's operating in normal law, sorry, alternate law. So one of the, uh, one of the sensors that's providing information to uh, the flight control computer is this thing here. It's called a pitot tube. Basically measures air pressure in front and behind of the plane. Uh, and you can see here on, uh, this is actually the, the Air France 447 uh, plane itself. On the undercarriage of it, um, there's actually a bunch of different pitot tubes. So a nice redundant system, which is awesome. Uh, we've got a pitot probe for first officer, for the captain, and for the standby as well. And all this information is fed into the flight control computer over a series of pneumatic lines and electrical lines. The problem with this, though, is the law reconfiguration feedback. Um, how specifically uh, the pilots are made aware that the plane has, the flight control computer, has migrated from one mode to another. So we're very, very lucky in hindsight to be able to actually see this information. Um, in fact, it was some of the first information that ever came to hand when uh, people started investigating this incident. So there's a system called ACARS, and basically it radios uh, important information from the plane to a satellite, to a ground station, goes over the ACARS network on land, and then it goes to Air France, or whoever the uh, airline operator is. Uh, and there's a bunch of important information that it, that it relays here. Non-vocal communication messages, operational computer messages, uh, communication messages, and maintenance messages. And so we had this data set to be able to look at. And in fact, this is, you know, like I said, this is the first data that uh, the investigators were able to look at. There's quite a lot of events that are happening here in the last sort of 10 minutes. Um, but this particular one here is really, really telling. It's actually saying that the flight control computer has migrated from this normal law to an alternate law. Unfortunately, the feedback that was provided to the pilots was that, a small textual warning on an enormous dashboard with all the knobs, bells, and whistles that you can imagine. Unfortunately, while this was being communicated on the dashboards, the realization didn't actually kick in until a few minutes later. So specifically, these three comments here are really, really telling. So Bonin is saying that, oh, actually, I've been pitching the nose up for a while now. And the captain realizes about two seconds later, oh, actually, we're in a stall. That explains everything that's happening. Unfortunately, by that point, uh, that was you know, 40 seconds before the plane was about to pancake in the ocean. So how does your HA provide you feedback? Do you have any sort of reconfiguration feedback when it migrates from one mode to another? Do you understand how these modes behave differently, like in a database clustering software, monitoring system, that sort of thing? Do you know all the modes that your system can operate under? Have you seen all of those modes? A really important fundamental concept here is sensory feedback, so you know, providing contextually relevant information to the people that are operating that system. And one very simple way of doing that is uh, an, obvious set, uh, an obvious change in the color of the, of the messages you're providing back, the size, and the font. Uh, and that has some interesting implications. So everyone put your hands up. Who here is able to see three colors on this screen? OK, great. Who here is seeing two colors? OK, and who here is seeing one color? OK, that's a, that's a bit interesting. So 10% um, of the male population is colorblind. So 10% of the male population wouldn't actually be able to distinguish between those colors. That's pretty important from an alert perspective. What about type? Who here thinks that this is easy to read? <laughs> it's atrocious, isn't it? That's a hell of a lot easier, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What about that? 
No, you all groan, you all groan. But it turns out the Comic Sans is actually a really, really easy to uh, decipher form of type. So I'm not in any way suggesting that you go out and redesign all your interfaces to use Comic Sans, but <laughs> you need to be aware of this sort of thing. And what you're trying to really do here is optimize for you at 3 a.m. You want these systems to be as operable as possible when you're operating in a high stress, probably sleep deprived incident. Let's have a look at another system that was operating here, the input control, specifically the co-pilot feedback. Now, in Airbus planes, when one pilot is pulling back on the stick or pushing down on the stick, there's actually no tactile feedback that's provided to the other pilot. So for a very large portion of this incident, incident uh, Bonin was pulling back on the stick, which was causing the plane to ascend until it got to such a high altitude, 38,000 feet, that the oxygen started petering out, and then the plane stalled all the way. The other problem is the flight control computer. So the flight control computer actually averages the inputs from the two different control sticks. So if you have one pilot pushing down on the stick and another pilot pushing up on the stick, it actually just cancels out one another. Now, there is a little bit of feedback that's provided to the operators. We've got this dual, impact, uh, dual input feedback light here. But as you can see, it's another very small light in a very large dashboard. And Airbus advocates that, uh, that pilots use this system called CRM, Crew Resource Management, uh, to handle the communication between the pilots to vocalize what everyone is thinking at any point in time. But unfortunately, in high-stress situations like this, you have a thing called the startling effect, where basically people just shut down and they start reverting to uh, well-trained behavior. And sometimes that well-trained behavior in this particular scenario How about that? Hey, there we go. So in the startling effect, you basically uh, shut down uh, and you revert to that normal training. Um, and in this particular case, in Air France 447, if the pilots had actually not touched any of the controls, they would have actually come out alive. But again, we have global rationality. Uh, we, have, we, can, we can see everything. We have all the facts at hand. So are your inputs averaged? How do, you, how do your engineers troubleshoot during incidents? How do you handle the coordination between those engineers? How do you know that two people aren't working on two systems, on the same system at, at the same time? Is it an every man for himself sort of scenario? Or are you coordinating the changes? Uh, does somebody actually have an overview of that? And specifically, does, is, is that responsibility assigned to someone? Do you have a process for doing that? Uh, how is the information disseminated within the team that's responding to that incident? And most importantly, how is that information getting outside of that incident response team to the business? You, know, you look at Tumblr last year, they had an 18 hour outage. Well, they had a very, very long outage, but there were 18 hours between updates. That's sort of bad. Do you have a formalized process for this? Or is it like a folk process, something that happens on an ad hoc basis? And if you have a process, are you actually actively practicing this? And I suppose at a higher level, what data are you actually relying on? Do you all, are you all singing from the same hymn book? Are you all looking at the same data? It's a fairly interesting question. So one simple way to mitigate a lot of these effects is to actually pair when you're responding to incidents. So hopefully you have enough people in your team where you can, uh, you can pair up with somebody when you're dealing with one of these problems. And a really important thing to do here is vocalize. So you know, actually, you know, it's sort of like a stream of conscious, uh, consciousness uh, with an internal monologue, but make that internal monologue external. So the other person knows what you're thinking. And it's really important when you're making these changes as well to minimize and compartmentalize those changes. And really importantly, uh, for analysis later on, is to actually record all the changes that you're making so that you can construct a timeline that's hopefully maintained by your coordinator. Uh, and it's massively useful for enabling retrospectives. So another system that was at play was the heads-up display. So there are isolated sensors here. Um, so if you look at the bottom of the plane, again, we've got the pitot tubes for the first officer, captain, and standby. And unfortunately, uh, they started reporting back completely different values. 
um, because some of the sensors froze up and then they thawed and then they froze up again. Uh, but they're all working with completely different information, all the pilots. So very significant discrepancies between all of this. I mean, you can see this pretty clearly here, right? You're climbing. No, I'm going down. Okay, we're going down. Oh, actually, I'm climbing again. And this, this particular one down here is particularly great. Uh, so we're in TOGA. It stands for Take Off, Go Around. So the, uh, the flight control computer is relaying to the pilots that, it think, that they think that they're actually taking off. So, so all the data is fairly badly munged at this point. It's completely unreliable. And Airbus take the position that, well, you should be using CRM to manage that. Uh, but unfortunately, if you have a fairly reduced adaptive capacity because you're dealing with, you know, you're in a high stress situation, um, that, that sort of, you know, communication isn't necessarily just going to happen. So I fundamentally believe there's actually significantly different navigational requirements uh, when it comes to responding to incidents. So contextual navigation is really, really important. Um, you want to have some sort of high-level dashboard overview of what's happening across all your different systems, and you want to be able to deep dive on the details to test a theory. And this is really about taking the scientific method and improvising in a very, very short feedback loop. So, you know, come up with a hypothesis, test it, reevaluate, do this in a big loop. And it's really important when you're doing that sort of thing here to make sure that that information is linkable so that you can share it with other people on the team that are responding to incidents as well. Ryan Tomeko uh, gave a really good talk uh, about October last year, um, talking about distributed teams within GitHub. And uh, one of the interesting things that he mentioned was that they try and make everything internally linkable. So everything has a reference that people can point back to. And this is really important from a correlation perspective because you'll have different people that are working on different problems under the same umbrella. And you need to be able to, you need to, be able to correlate between uh, those different threads of investigation. It doesn't make sense when you're dealing with a situation like this for everyone to have a single train, train of thought, like a linear progression. You're going to have multiple people working on this at any, at any time, right? Uh, and human pattern recognition here is actually pretty damn good, um, provided that you have enough adaptive capacity. You have enough cognitive slack to be able to test out and try different ideas. So one thing that factors into that is a stream of alerts. So there was actually 70 stall warnings uh, during, uh, during the last 15 minutes. Uh, and that's what sort of leads to uh, analysis like this. You know, they ignored the alarms. Right? They should have reacted. There's also a bunch of other things that are happening as well. Uh, an autopilot disconnect. Um, there's a specific tone that, this, that, the, that the aircraft emits when this happens. It's called the Calvary charge. It's very, very loud, uh, quite disorienting. Uh, and then, of course, we have the alternate law reconfiguration happening as well. So, you know, lots of different things happening simultaneously. How on earth are you meant to know the priority of the different alerts when you're being completely overloaded? So pilots ended up being overwhelmed by feedback. Uh, and this is a, a quite a well-known concept called alert fatigue. There was quite a lot of talk about it at Monitorama last week. And the startling effect really plays into here as well. Uh, so it reduces the adaptive capacity, that cognitive slack, to be able to deal with new stimuli. So dampening is one very, very simple way of solving this problem. What you want to have is some sort of high-level overview that says, oh, actually, you know, stuff's broken. <laughs> Um, one really simple way to do this is just a manual silence. So you take your monitoring system, you keep it uh, running the monitoring checks, but you disable all the notifications so that you're not overwhelming the people that are on call. Another simple way of doing this um, from an incident response perspective is limiting the number of engineers that are actually uh, watching those alerts and those graphs. Maybe we could do smarter things with tools as well. Uh, so PagerDuty sort of does something similar to this already, where if you have more than one alert that's assigned to an on-call engineer, uh, it will uh, provide a summary alert uh, for all subsequent alerts that come in. So rather than sending out 400 alerts, you send out one. Uh, and there's another project that I've been working on called Flapjack that's sort of trying to achieve a similar sort of thing. Uh, if you're interested, come and have a chat after this. So the crux of this talk is really about systems thinking and not looking at things in isolation and trying to decompose things from a Cartesian, Newtonian perspective. We need to internalize that the systems that we're working on are capable of failure, but they're also capable of success. In fact, they're really just modes of operation, shades of gray. 
So we have systems that enable communication that also expose secrets. A really good example of that is the US diplomatic cables that were leaked by WikiLeaks a few years back. Very, very useful for providing sensitive information to people in government. Not so great if you air all of that publicly. You have systems that might rob us, but there are also systems that fund innovation, like New York bankers. We have systems that kill us, and they're also the same systems that allow billions of people every year to fly around the world. Failure is fundamentally pervasive, and in complex systems, like the complex systems that we're operating, complex failure is complex. Failure is just another normal mode of operation. You have to learn to expect it. Your systems probably aren't controlling the fate of people's lives, but you may have people that are depending on it quite a bit. And we really need to move away from this position of anthropocentrism, which is perceiving the world as humans being the centre of everything, the centre of the universe. We need to also be careful that we don't drift too far to the other end of the spectrum uh, and go towards technocentrism, which is that you know, everything is just one big series of nested systems and humans are just a cog. Not, not particularly relevant or interesting. We're really operating here in this squishy middle ground between the two. We're talking about building operable systems, an interface between man and machine. There's no amoral actors in any of these systems, and it's really important to keep that in mind. And if you look at uh, Chesley Sullenberger, who was the pilot uh, that successfully managed to ditch an Airbus plane into the Hudson River, uh, had this particular quote about AF-447. If you look at the human factors alone, then you're missing half or two-thirds of the total system failure. And adopting this mentality is massively important so that the final words of a man about to die isn't turned into a pithy newspaper headline. Thank you. All right, I've got time for two questions. <laughs> I think I've, you know, we've got a bit of alert fatigue going on. All right, up there. I haven't seen anything published, but you should go research that and write up about it, because that would be really interesting. What was uh, sorry, the question was, there, had there been any sort of comparisons between uh, what happened in Apollo 13 uh, and with AF-447? James. So the question was, are there uh, other alerting systems that we can look at that maybe solve this problem a little bit better? Um, every domain has significant problems. Um, so John Oswald has been talking uh, quite a bit recently about the problems within, uh, within medicine and the sort of alerts that are passed through to people, like surgeons, when they're dealing with people on the operating table, and you know, massive false positives there. Um, I don't think anyone is dealing with this. I think that in a lot of ways we're actually on the cutting edge. Um, and that's cool. We just need to find solutions. If you're interested in this sort of thing, I can highly recommend uh, reading any of these three books by Sidney Decker. I would highly recommend uh, probably starting with Drift into Failure. Uh, John Rouser gave a great talk at Velocity a few years ago about knowing your data and doing sort of human correlation. Uh, and if you're interested in a long and somewhat depressing read, you should have a look at the BEA report on the AF-447 incident. Uh, there's uh, copies of it in French and English. All right, thank you very much.